This is Coolcast for November 2nd, 2011, uh, which is an open-ended discussion about collaborative open online learning. And we happen these days, Wednesdays at 1400 GMT. We talk about MOOCs, these massive open online courses, and also uh, assorted projects that educators are working on to include uh, open educational resources in their learning. And uh, Today, we have a special featured guest for the first time. Uh, and Jim, welcome. I'm going to go ahead and mute you because we're getting a little bit of funky audio from you. Uh, I asked Tim Owens to join us. Hello, Tim. Hi. Uh, Tim posted something uh, a couple weeks ago about where is the change related to the Change 11 MOOC. And we're going to get to that, no doubt, eventually. But first, I'd love to hear a little bit about the Tim Owens story. Uh, so, oh, Tim, who are you? What do you do? Sure. So, uh, I work at the University of Mary Washington in the Division of Teaching and Learning Technologies. We often just refer to it as DTLT online. It's, uh, you know, Jim Groom, uh, Martha Burtis, Andy Rush, the group here. Uh, and I've only actually been working here about three months. So, as Jim would say, I'm still on probation here. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I've been in higher ed for about five years now. Uh, in the IT sector. I was originally an IT support type person before I got into the instructional technology side. Um, been in Virginia uh, almost all my life. Uh, I was at Longwood University before Mary Washington. And so now I work in DTLT and, you know, support stuff there. The UMW blogs, uh, the DS106 MOOC, I've been very heavily involved in, which is actually how I ended up meeting Jim Groom. So, uh, it all plays together nicely. Now, I read from your online bo bio that uh, you actually studied design. How did a design did. guy get into TLT? Yeah. <laughs> well, one thing is jobs. Uh, it, I found out that it's fairly difficult for a graphic designer to find a job. But no, it really, so my, my uh, major was studio art graphic design. And so I got into web design. I was always a computer nerd uh, from the get go. Uh, but coming out of college, my wife was still oops, my wife was still taking some courses at school. So I said, well, um, I had been a student technician and a position opened up in the IT department. I said, well, I'll do that for a while. I can do the computer thing. And so by being in the IT department in higher ed, I got to see sort of both sides of the spectrum. I got to see what faculty were dealing with and uh, what the IT side of it, what they were trying to support and deal with. And that just got me really interested in how technology was being used in education. And it went from there. So uh, what's the uh, TLT job interview process like there? I'm curious, like <laughs> did Jim, Jim Groom make you do any sort of funky stuff to get the job or? No, it wasn't too bad at all. So uh, I mean, you know, just the typical typical interview process. He was a part of a larger panel, so he had to be good, I think. <laughs> All right. uh, the, ha hey, the, ha the hazing started after I took the job. <laughs> no doubt. So uh, tell us about an average day. What, what's your, your day like? Well, uh, one thing that's really nice is our office is a very um, large open space. So if you consider it almost like a press room, all of our desks face each other. There's a lot of collaboration going on, which I absolutely love. When I came to this office, I said, this is the great place to be at. Um, you know, so there's a lot of collaboration. We're always working on projects together. Uh, we all have particular assignments in terms of uh, content areas and the faculty that we support, but it's really, you know, just in name alone, because anytime anything comes up. Uh, we're constantly bouncing ideas back and forth off each other. Um, as far as a typical day, you know, I'll occasionally get questions from faculty on how they can use a certain product or if I have any ideas on what products are out there that could meet a particular need. Uh, a big thing that we've been doing now is um, web video broadcasting. So we have um, DTLT Today, which is a show that we started fairly shortly after I got here. Jim and I had been talking a little bit about whether we could do some web video type things. And so we started doing that and we do that every day. Uh, so half of our office is our desks and the other half of it is sort of this uh, put together um, makeshift studio, I guess you would call it. But I, I hesitate to even call it a studio because <laughs> it's more a couch and a large green screen and a camera. So, But, but it's a fine couch. You've cranked out 71? 70, 72 episodes as of yesterday. So, yeah. And um, uh, good things going on there. So, now you were not around for DS106 last year, correct? 
not at Mary Washington. I participated in DS-106 as a online, open online student. Okay. Is uh, DS-106 happening again soon? DS-106 will happen again in the spring. Yes. Okay. They um, did not fill any courses for the fall. I guess they just decided they had been offered too many times, and so uh, they didn't offer it here. However, it is currently running at CUNY up in New York with Michael Branson Smith is running a course out of there, and Scott Lowe is running a course out of Japan, and they are all being incorporated into that DS-106 feed. So it kind of expanded. We had this idea that DS-106 didn't have to be a Mary Washington thing. It could be anybody who wanted to be pulled in. So right now, those two uh, institutions are pulling their students' feeds directly in there, so, which is cool because I get to see that student work as well since I subscribe to that feed. Oh, very cool. Uh, all right, which brings us to Change 11. Yeah. Uh, and your post, uh, where is the change? Uh, start us with your beginning. Your uh, Have you participated in any of the um, previous MOOCs? Uh, what were your hopes and expectations? What was your post about? Well, I've got to say that I'm fairly new to the MOOC world in general. My DS-106 was my first experience with it. And to be fair, DS-106 was very different in the way that they delivered content from the MOOCs that I've read about, like, you know, from Downs and Siemens and them, CCK and those kind of MOOCs. Uh, it was just a different approach. Um, now, that being said, and I should mention, I watched the whole EdTech Weekly show, and anybody who wants to get caught up on a lot of that backstory should probably watch it, because I think you all did a fairly decent job of covering a lot of the things that I said in the post and sort of my criticisms and your take on it. So, uh, But basically, we came at it from a standpoint. Um, the backstory on it was that we were watching Change 11 happen. Um, I have not participated too heavily in it. I've tried to watch some of the posts and feeds, but, you know, it's huge. So you jump in, you jump out when you can, that kind of thing. Uh, but it was clear from the get-go that they were having problems with synchronous video sessions, or not just video, but synchronous sessions. Uh, they went through several different products and had put a call out to their network basically saying if anybody has any ideas we're kind of struggling here fuse meeting isn't working well big blue button uh, which they invested a lot of money in is not working well everything's just sort of crashing because it's on on a larger scale so Jim Groom and I were talking and he said you know we ought to offer to do sort of a live stream type thing basically taking the model that we were using daily for the DTLT today type broadcast and sort of produce a show for them and, you know, we could pull in their um, session each week. Uh, we could pull in the chat. We could, you know, do some interactive type stuff. We could do basically anything that they wanted to do. And then they wouldn't have to worry about the technology, right? We could be the people on the back end, you know, basically producing the thing for them. And they could get to the teaching and the facilitating part. Uh, and so that that's basically what we offered. We did a DTLT today. And I episode. should mention you had a really nice first date. I, I guess that's what you were just going to mention, kind of discussing the the possibilities for this, and it was a great conversation. And then you yeah, had a, first, a second date, I guess. <laughs> I love how you compare it to a marriage or a date. <laughs> So, um, yeah, we, we had a discussion with them. We turned it into a DTLT Today episode, and it is archived on dtlttoday.com. I forget which episode number it is, uh, but basically just saying, hey, this is our idea. What do you think of it? And, you know, they liked it. They had some interest, and so we decided to move forward with it, not so much as a replacement to their general session because they felt like um, the people that they were working with to run e the sessions each week, we're going to be more comfortable in um, Illuminate, which is now Blackboard Collaborate. So they said, we'll do a separate session on Friday that'll be a bit more casual and we can experiment with some of this stuff. So, you know, we moved forward with that and we tried it out. And my basic criticism of it, and I think you brought up the criticism as well in uh, EdTech Weekly, was just that there wasn't a whole lot of interactivity there. What ended up happening was just, you know, I was there watching them talk and basically doing a screencast of that and pushing it out online. Um, and so there wasn't a whole lot of interactivity. And that was my basic criticism was that it felt like uh, they weren't giving the technology a chance, I guess, or being flexible and open to trying new things. And I didn't really want to make the post uh, about the issues between DTLT and the group. I mean, they have their own 
methods and their own approaches and we have our own and that's fine uh, I wanted to be more to have it be more about how the idea of MOOCs in general should be that we should all be open to these kind of things and I saw it even in the chat during the session itself people were like oh I don't like all of these changes to all these different platforms I always have to go to a new one and I don't like it and it's interesting because the whole idea is that you should be open to change that you should be open to this and to exploring and learning new things and here people were complaining about having to go to yet a different URL and have to learn a new set of technologies so yeah and, and just to uh, quote some of your passages from that some aspects are so offensive to the very pedagogy that these very men preach that I believe they deserve to be called out on it and the idea that a course could use co uh, collaborate simply because it is a comfortable space for instructors is just wrong um, <laughs> which I, you know I, I understand that point and if, if the name of the course and I, I you prefaced your post and I want to preface everything I say is that I have nothing but respect and affection for all of the people involved in this professionally and personally absolutely and you know I, I think we criticize because we look to them for as leaders in the field and especially right. in a course called change about online learning I, I get your point about, oh, I have to go to a different URL, I have to try a different tool. It seems to me that the course is not just about the content, but it's about the methodology. It's about the mm -hmm. experimentation. Yeah. I, I certainly didn't pull any punches, as you mentioned in the post, but and it was a hard post to write. It was one of the first times that I was really challenging people that I look up to, and that's one of the reasons I had to write it, right? Because, you know, it, that's a hard thing to do, but you do it anyway because you know that something good's going to come out of it, and I think some of the discussion that happened in the comments was good. Um, I think some of the criticism that and pushback that I got back was fair. And what I don't understand is you had such a nice first date, you had a nice second date, and then you broke up so suddenly. Uh, one, you know, I think Stevens mentioned, you know, you kind of broke up without giving it a chance. Is there a backstory that we're not hearing or we shouldn't be hearing as to why things just crashed and burned? You know, I, I, I don't want to make it personal. I, I think it's just a difference of methods. Uh, you know, uh, Stephen Downs is the type of person that really wants to own everything that he's doing and understand the technology, and he's really, really good at what he does. And But the thing is, you know, Google Voice, we can't use that. We need to use some separate RSS shopper plug-in, and I want to make it open and do this. There's a lot of ideas floating out there, and it was just pretty clear that it was oil and water in terms of a collaborative effort. And <laughs> <laughs> you know, in, in the chat room, Stephen, I really hope you can get into this hangout <laughs> because uh, as soon as you said that, I knew Stephen was going to say, wants to own everything he's doing, uh, <laughs> and he's using every uh, texting exclamation he can. Now, he, <laughs> now, which chat am I supposed to be because oh, I'm, sorry, I'm not able to follow this? That's at edtechtalk.com slash live. <laughs> Um, I'll I'll jump over there to sort of monitor that as well. Uh, I Stephen, I don't mean in terms wanted, of the. I'm sorry, sorry. Stephen. If you want to try to jump in and troubleshoot your your hangout issues live or find a computer, or I can even Skype you in if uh, required, because I really do want to hear what you have to say uh, about all this. All right, let me. And see. and also, Jim, while you're getting uh, while you're getting into the chat. Um, Tim, Jim, I thought your comment on that thread was was quite um, quite appropriate. What what did you have to say as you read that uh, discussion? And you'll have to unmute yourself to chime in. Yeah, I got a headset now, so you shouldn't be getting feedback from my thing. Yeah, I was just finishing typing basically some things that I'd said in the uh, in my response too. Like I, I'd really like to see that keep on going. I think it was a a great um, way to do the Friday thing, which didn't need to be quite as interactive as the uh, earlier live sessions. And uh, I sort of hope they can get things together. But uh, sort of in defense of Illuminate, I said uh, it's great to experiment with all these things, and we, we learn a lot by doing a lot of different things. It's nice to have something that's familiar to the participants to come back to. Uh, illuminate so where we can sort of regroup and, and discuss things. It reminded me a bit of a uh, 
a grid hopping thing that we did uh, back in Plank, where a number of us went to Joy Kata Grid, and we used Skype as sort of our voice to, to keep everything together because uh, we couldn't just keep it together with one technology. So having sort of a fallback to uh, gather everything together and keep things coordinated um, was uh, one of my ideas. And, you know, as far as the interactivity, uh, DTLT doesn't do a lot of interactivity during their webcast, do they? No, I mean, it's not framed as such. It, it's a podcast. We've tried some things like that, especially earlier on. We played around with the idea. We had um, Twitter messages popping up over the screen as we with certain hashtags as we were broadcasting. We had the chat overlaid on there. The problem with it was just that sometimes we might have three people watching and no one interacting. Sometimes we didn't have anybody watching us. And so it was like to put in all of these extra methods. A lot of times you saw an extra area on the screen with the chat section and nothing was happening in it for the entire podcast so uh you know we've played around with it we'll play around with it again but to me uh dtlttoday.com was a, a video podcast that was meant to you know be us, us in the office basically you know doing a web type video uh, as a blog um and so you know it, whether we collaborate in there or not you know sometimes we do and sometimes we don't uh, and i finally got into the chat uh, one thing that uh Stephen mentions is, you know, that he had a lot of issues with Google Voice on his work computer, which is fine. And, you know, he says, I'm not addressing that. My, my basic concern with that was, again, if something doesn't work on Stephen Down's computer, do you not use that technology at all? Or do you say, let's try and figure out ways to make this work? And I think at the end of the day, you know, whether things are working or not on a, a particular user's computer shouldn't be the end of the discussion. And, and Dave Cormier and I uh, had a, an active discussion on this week's EdTech Weekly about the interactive component. And I see value in it. I mean, I, I know it's messy, but I feel like there's room for messiness in learning in Absolutely. general and certainly in a, a change MOOC. Uh, and I understand if they want to sort of have a, a more uh, structured presentation mode. Uh, oh, Stephen is back. And as, as Dave mentions, you know, if, you're just, if it's just going to be a presentation, you don't really need Illuminate. And, you know, for a lot of the, you know, you have the chat, but you could do a presentation like this or even with Google presentations and, and have a, a live text chat. And, you know, when I said, you know, I think the interaction is important, I said, well, that's great. You're doing that with Coolcast. You know, other people can do that. I think mm -hmm. there's value in, you know, having the facilitators of the course be able to interact with the participants uh, yeah. because I, I think people want that. You know, we, we talked a lot about the whole open education resource university and, and how one of the missing pieces, you know, you've got the content, you've got the assessment, but this middle piece of what does the teacher do? What does the facilitator do? And, and I think that's what George, Stephen, and Dave are, that's their role. And I think people would like to connect with them. And at this point, maybe we should uh, bring Carol into this conversation because you're running your own MOOC and I'm curious on your thoughts about all of this and interaction and MOOCs and everything else. Well, I think the variety of options that are available <clears throat> and that can be available are terrific. I don't think one is better than the other. I think each one serves a different purpose, a different function, whether it's for the participants, the facilitators, or the presenters. Now, yesterday I saw an EC381 presentation, and at the moment, because I'm an old woman, the name of the presenter escapes me, but all of the uh, participants worked on the whiteboard. They did drawings, they did writing, they did all sorts of things, and there was conversation back and forth. There was the side chat, and for something like that, I think the Blackboard, and trust me, I've had my issues with Blackboard, but the Blackboard is perhaps the best option at this particular point in time. Um, for podcasts, I think DS106 and the group at UMW has really some fantastic ideas and that can be used as well. Uh, we used to get together in Second Life after a formal quote-unquote presentation and have our little discussions. I think the, um, the thing that Timmy has done and the folks at DS106 is another option. I don't think one is better than the other. I think the variety 
of potentials is really fantastic. And it's just a, a question of using which, when, where, and how. And hopefully, it works for not only the presenters and the facilitators, but also for the participants. We see Stephen. We hear Stephen. Participants is if it doesn't work, they leave. Right. Do you actually hear me? Yes, you must. Excellent. Yes, yes we do. So, Stephen. I yield the floor. Yeah. <laughs> Any thoughts, <laughs> Stephen? Anything you'd like to share? <laughs> Anything I'd like to share? Well, first of all, uh, I don't think that the issues should be so personalized the way they have been in the blog post and in the discussion that's been happening so far. The a lot of the commentary that's being made is along the lines of such and such because Stephen doesn't want to such and such or such and such because Stephen doesn't think that such and such or sometimes it refers to the other people in, in offering the course as well so it's just because they don't want to do this or they don't want to do that and that's a load of hooey frankly um, it's not that I don't want to use Google Talk or Hangout or anything like that and anyone anyone who knows me knows that assertions like that are bloody ridiculous. I've tried every tool on the map. I've tried tools that don't exist anymore. I've tried tools that before they came into existence. I've used dozens and dozens and dozens of different conferencing tools over the years. I mean, I remember using see you, see me. Uh, you know, it's, so it's ridiculous to say, I don't want to try new things. I mean, so, and the idea that you would base an inference about what we do or do not want to do on a very narrow set of experiences, in, in my case, an experience of one event is, again, ridiculous. Now, George perhaps jumped the gun a little bit when he said, well, we're just going to go to eliminate. But two things are true. First of all, we know eliminate works. And it works really well. It does work. And, and secondly, uh, we weren't sure that the live stream was working. We did know that the various other things we had been trying to that point uh, including the big blue button installation, and we tried a couple of different installs of that. Uh, you know, and for someone who doesn't want to try new things, that was not only me trying new things, that was me trying new things and writing a complete API library for this new thing in Perl in order to try this new thing. Um, and that didn't work. Uh, it, it blew a gasket at 63 participants. Uh, sad but true. Uh, we tried Wise IQ, but uh, you know, and again, I set up an account and all of that. Uh, signed up for the pro account, and it didn't deliver as promised. Uh, we we tried uh, Fuse Meeting again, blew up on us. Uh, just wasn't sufficient. So that was by week three of the course. So by the time we got here, we had been trying new things nonstop, and then. To have someone turn around and say, "Well, they don't want to try new things," um, you know, just it strikes me as ridiculous. Now, even trying to make this thing work, I spent that entire session trying to make things work. Uh, it's one I'm thing sorry, to say which session the the that was the the one the one and only the second uh, session we had with DL. It was the only, it was, I, was, I only participated in one uh, at DTLT. But you had the planning one, and then you had the, the week in review one. Oh, the, the planning one I didn't really consider one because okay. it was just a planning discussion. So, okay. uh, yeah, okay, fair point. Um, that one, and that one worked fine. And that one, and it's funny because what we did in the, in the Friday was pretty much identical to what we did in the planning one. Uh, it's just there was this expectation that we should be doing more. Well, you know, I spent that session trying to make things work well in that session. And, you know, as I've mentioned, I do have this Google Hangout issue on my 
office computer and here's here's my office computer this is the computer in my office the computer I'm on now is the laptop that I brought into the office in anticipation of this right um, so but I don't always have it here and so I can't always do these things it wasn't the the Google Chat, Google Hangout was not working properly on the office computer. At the same time, I'm attempting to record because I record these things with Audacity. Not this session because it's not one of my sessions, but uh, all the course sessions I tried to record in Audacity. That was failing. It was all failing. And that happens. You know, and, and you know, I spent a long time trying to work through those issues. I, by my count, about four hours until. I came to the conclusion that this sound issue with Google Hangout is a known issue. It affects some Windows 7 computers. There isn't a fix yet, um, and they're quote-unquote working on it. So right now there is no fix for that. Okay, fine. There is no fix. The, the, the fix is to bring another computer. But until I can bring another computer in, it's not on the table to use Google Chat, right? Because I can't poof manufacture a computer out of thin air. And then... So it's not reasonable to say, oh, he just didn't want to use Google Chat. I didn't want to use Google Chat because I can't manufacture computers out of thin air. That's my reason. So, And, and, and I don't want to get too much into to the personal dating history of, of well, <laughs> TLC. Can I respond, can I respond to that criticism well, real quick? Well, that, that, that was my first experience, right? So <laughs> there isn't a history. That was it. Yeah. I did. My only response to the Google Voice thing, just just to clarify one particular note, was that my suggestion from the get-go was that we use it as a voicemail service that we could pipe the audio into everyone. So I, I don't think whether it works on one computer was really that relevant um, because the idea was just that we could take live calls and pipe the audio feed into everyone else. Now, I don't know if that still plays into whether it works on your computer or not, but the idea was from the get-go, you know, what I what I had wanted it to be was that we would handle the technology aspects so that all you would have to do was join a chat and listen and respond and interact with people. And, and I, I'm sorry if that wasn't clear. Yeah, that, that wasn't clear. It sounded like you're saying to me, use Google Chat. And, and, and on that note, and I, and I want to kind of get back to talking about change and, and options mm -hmm. and tools. You mentioned that your, your Illuminate works great, Stephen. Really? Do you feel satisfied with Illuminate? I mean, I understand it might be the best option out there at this point, yeah. but I feel like the audio is never that great. For interactivity, for discussions, it's always clunky. It doesn't have that full duplex feel. And like just to watch the recordings, you know, I, the rec first of all, the recordings take a couple days to come out. And I, you know, you click on it, and then you click again, and it loads. And okay, Java run. I, I understand if it's the best option out there, and it's so not open. I mean, I understand you have access to it, but are you comfortable and happy using Illuminate? No, the short answer is no. Uh, for the, for those issues, uh, those very issues, uh, you know, you try to do an audio recording off an Illuminate recording, and you see just how awful that sound is. So when I do audio recordings of these sessions, I'm recording them live so that I'm not recording them off of an audio recording, and that kind of gets the sound out okay, but the recording sound is just terrible. Uh, it really is. I mean, Steve Hargan's, uh recordings were, because I wanted to put some of them on Ed Radio. I thought, oh, great, does all these Illuminate shows. I'll put them on Ed Radio. It'll be great. All I need to do is create an MP3 out of the Illuminate. And it was unlistenable, just completely unlistenable. Um, so I agree. There are, you know, the openness, yeah, I also agree with that. Of course, the system we're using here isn't any more open. I mean, live stream Google Hangout, it's not like I can access that technology either. That's one of the things that really attracted me to Big Blue Button, especially, you know, given that, you know, there was the, the Java backend, which I could mess around with if I really wanted to, but even better, because it was API-based, I could set it up the way I wanted it to, you know, and... It's still, even to this day, anybody enrolled in our course can go to our 
our page and, and run their own big blue button session. It's still running. It's just nobody uses it. Yeah, I, I was saddened by that. Uh, I don't want to say failure, but let's say lack of mm -hmm. success. Um, and I'll say failure. <laughs> <laughs> well, and, and I think that Dave Cormier had a really good point on EdTech Weekly is that the argument that everything has to be <clears throat> that everything has to be completely open that you have to use all open yeah. source products it just doesn't hold any water and i've tried to be careful yeah. not to make those kind of arguments that everything you use has to be open source you know i'm no stallman so uh, <laughs> you know i understand the need for certain products and i understand mm -hmm. why people like illuminate and i think it does have its place in certain instances and, and to me open is the ideal but i'll take replicable you know, and right now I'm a guy with a computer and a couple of monitors who's not spending any money to use these tools to stream this conversation. And yeah. you know, one of the things Dave was saying was, oh, yeah, but, you know, you can do that. That's really hard to do. It's a skill. It's a literacy. But the change course is, you know, a bunch of ed tech geeks. It's not that hard. Um, yeah. And I, I'd, I'd welcome the experimentation with that. And I don't know, Stephen, maybe you feel like that's not your role to do that, that you're providing the, the forum for all this, and if you guys want to play, go, go play. But I think in, to a certain extent, you guys are a victim of your own successes and reputation for being pioneers. And so when the course is called Change, people tune in saying, all right, we want to know the latest and greatest and coolest and openest stuff. And what do you feel like is, where is the change in Change 11? Not only in content, but in methodology. Yes. Well, we're still pioneering this whole connectivism thing, and I realize now that we're no longer the first people in the world to be doing it, or even the biggest people in the world to be doing it. Uh, you know, it's been done. We're still trying to do some things. Uh, some of them aren't visible, uh, especially. I've tried to integrate Grasshopper to a much greater degree. Uh, some of them are visible, but are spectacular failures, such as the integration of Big Blue Button with Grasshopper. <laughs> um, we're also something we're bringing in a new person each week, and almost like rebooting the course each week, and that's proving incredibly tough to do. Um, tougher than you might imagine. We've had guests before. But having guests is one thing. Having each week of the course structured around the thought and ideas of a new person is, is something very different. And we've had a lot of trouble with coordination and scheduling. Dave, uh, George, and I all have very busy schedules. And it's turning out too busy schedules sometimes. Like I'm, I'm just back, for example, from being on the road for two weeks. Uh, where was the change in those two weeks? Uh, well, it was <laughs> it was somewhere. In, it was in my stolen camera bag, my food poisoning, my New York call. You know, all of that. It just when things blow up, sometimes they blow up, um, and that's that's the way it goes. I think we've done some neat things in this course. I think that uh, you know, if I can get all of the data entry into Grasshopper working properly, that would be wonderful. Um, but uh, really getting a handle on the schedule with the, you know, we had nice regular meeting dates in all previous courses. This year, for some reason, for some reason, and I don't do the scheduling, so I don't know the reason, but they're bouncing all over the place. And it might just be the times, and it might just be the people, I don't know. So I think there's change there. Uh, it's not all positive change. It's not all successful change. And I, I think we are pushing frontiers, but I think it's hard for people to see that given some of the difficulties we've had. One of the changes I was looking forward to, to seeing in change and just in general I like to see included is the interactivity component, especially media hmm. activity, interactivity. And Stephen, you had mentioned about integrating uh, an audio RSS. Tim, I was listening on your latest yeah. DTLT talk about um, um, what's the the LMS you guys are using? 
Oh, Canvas. Canvas, and how they mm-hmm. integrate Kaltura. And, you know, my EdTech Weekly buddies mm. are always making fun of me for, you know, using Snapvine audio comments or whatever, and it's, it's never gained traction. But I still feel like there's some potential there for having yeah. this asynchronous conversation in, in a vibrantly media-rich way. Yep, and that's still planned. I still want to do that. And the only thing that's preventing that is <laughs> with all the problems with our synchronous environment, I have not had a chance to write the scripts that would pre- create the output of that. Uh, you need to write basically your podcast feed. Um, and what that means is pulling your MP3 links from your database and putting them to a nice format. It's not a major piece of coding to do, but it's coding to do. It has to be done. Uh, because again, it just doesn't happen itself. I've set it up, set up the aggregator so that all the feeds coming in are analyzed. And I do have an aside. Oh, I also have a phone call. Um, can you guys continue for a sec? Sure. I'm going to go ahead and mute you. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Well, one thing that I was going to say that um, is, you know, we've said it before and I'll say it again. Learning is messy. This process is messy and that's okay. And that's not something that we should downplay and say, you know, oh, this is a problem, so to speak. My criticism has never been, man, this MOOC is a complete failure. You know, look at all the problems they're having. I love problems. DS-106 has had numerous problems and, you know, especially with the radio component and us just playing around with that. that and that's, that is okay. And it's okay to be, and people should be accepting of that. And and speaking of messy and interactive, I just want to send out the invitation again to people to join this hangout. Uh, I will put that uh, URL in the chat room at edtechtalk.com slash live. All are welcome. We'd love to hear your comments. Speaking of which, Carol, I, you made some comments in the chat room that I'd love to get into the video. Do you want to read them? <laughs> uh, no, I just share what your thoughts were as, as uh, Steve. Well, I have to go about. back and read them again. Or <laughs> uh, <laughs> basically, what I was chatting about is that, and it, and it builds on what Timmy said, learning is messy, and it's not always perfect. Um, I'm new to facilitating and even developing a MOOC, but I've been playing around in the MOOCs with Downs, uh, Siemens and Cormier for a couple of years now and I found it a fantastic experience. It really did take some uh, oh, some time for me to jump in and go with the flow as uh, Chicksent Mahali would say, but I find it fascinating and I find that the participants who are new to it also have a learning curve, maybe not as steep as mine, maybe steeper than mine, depends upon who they are. I think all of the technologies are valid. Um, as I said before, there are many different types of learning styles, may preferences, um, and I think the main goal is to keep participants engaged. Some entities are more engaging than others. Some are going to work and some are not. And I think while critiquing is valid, I'm not sure criticism is helpful. Um, it's easier to more or less work together and I know in my experiences I've been fairly open with all of the problems that I've had, which haven't been a multitude, but I have found other people from other parts of the world jumping in to give me solutions. And that's one of the things that I truly value about the community of people, um, from, from Jeff to Stephen to Jim. I mean, Jim helped me last year. Uh, on some technical issues. I'm not a tech person and I find this community of learners and community of givers of learning facilitators to be absolutely fabulous. And that's basically all I have to say. <laughs> and I thank everybody. Uh, what we were discussing the messiness of uh, learning in general and MOOCs in particular, Stephen, and um, speaking of messy, and and I agree, <laughs> crit- crit- <laughs> like I, I feel like it's it's unfair to you know criticize you guys so much because I know you all have lots of other projects and and it's not like you're making money on this thing or anything. But the newsletter, which you know I think of as kind of 
the the core of the change 11 or or the the spine mm-hmm. somehow has gotten really messy with twitter po- tweets in the blog section like you have blogs and forums and twi- tweets that's, and there's lots of tweets in the blog section shouldn't be that should be fixed let me check today's great to have connections yeah uh, <laughs> um t- i also do mm. Uh, I would like see. to right now uh, yeah, they're back. Yeah, very much right. for all of his help um, with the RSS feed. Um, he installed it for our particular MOOC. He then went on vacation and then every Wednesday or one day a week he would come back and we would consult. I then uh, developed a relationship with a fellow in China who helped teach it to me because of course Stephen didn't have time to teach me. and. I didn't learn as much as I would like to, but I really do want to publicly thank Stephen Downs for his his help and his support in our initial uh, jumping into the pond, as it were, the MOOC pond, while he's busy fixing something, looking for something. Yeah, yeah, there is. I do see a Twitter post in the blog post list. That shouldn't be there. I thought I'd fix that. Uh, it's, it's all about gardening the rhizome, you know? It's, it's yeah. a messy little creature. Um, Tim, I'd love to hear a little bit more about... Uh, Boy, that's really annoying. <laughs> you know, it, it, and so much of, uh, of navigating a MOOC is about filtering the noise. And it's not all noise, but, you know, finding what you want to find. And that's yeah. not an easy thing to do. Yeah. Um, and the tweets, I mean, I love Twitter, but boy, they cause a lot of noise. Cause yeah, there's a lot of that. And then they retweet it, and they retweet it, and they, you know... That's why I subscribe to one person on Twitter. <laughs> Who's that one person? Twitter. Oh. <laughs> um, Tim, any thoughts on on how you deal with the mess in DS106 or in your other projects? Well, it's funny. I was just putting in the chat that DS106 has the exact same problem. How do you filter all of the all of the stuff coming out of a MOOC because, you know, when you're doing something on a massive scale and DS-106 isn't even Mm -hmm. all that massive, I would say. It's got a a huge following of people, but in terms of participants, it's not massive. But it's enough that if you just subscribe to the main feed, it's a ton of stuff. And how do you filter all that stuff? I don't have any really good answers with that. Um, You know, that was something that Jim and Martha, you know, they basically built out the online component back in the spring, and then DS-106 was not carried in through the fall. Uh, you know, the summer was completely different. We tried something a lot newer in terms of delivering video and stuff. So I don't have any really good answers for how do you filter out and how do you um, let the good stuff rise to the top. It, it, and how and that, do you make the magic happen? That's criticism. You know, like... There was, you know, every course is different. Every cohort of a course is different. But there was something magical about last year's DS-106. What was it? And not that you can replicate it, but how do you plant the seeds to allow that to happen? <laughs> I, don't, I don't know if you can, and I don't know if Stephen has any ideas around this. For me, the spring thing, what was so amazing about it was just that so many people came together that, made really close connections both in Twitter, uh, both online, commenting on blogs, and those connections continue to exist even, you know, at, as we all travel out to different conferences and stuff, meeting back up. It, it was mind-blowing to me to find out, like, Jim Groom didn't know, you know, certain people that I would I thought, well, they've acted like they're friends all their life, and, it's, and that's the way it goes sometimes, right? You meet these people on Twitter or Google Plus or Facebook or wherever you are, and you get to know them so intimately that it feels like a close personal connection. And then when you meet in a conference, you know, as I'm sure I'll meet some of you all at some point in the future, it will be as if, you know, we've known each other much longer, uh, even though we might meet face-to-face for the first time. And, um but I don't know how you foster that environment or if it's like a viral video. It just has to happen. And, you know, one of the things that Jim was mentioning in his, his presentation this week was that one of the things that happened was so much commenting, you know, which I think creates some of that magic when it's a conversation. And in change, I, you know, I haven't tuned in that carefully, I don't get the sense of a lot of conversation. There's some people blogging, there's some tweeting back and forth, but I don't know how much commenting is going on. 
and that brings us to the the whole interactivity thing on on the Friday possibility of you know having that become more interactive. I don't know where the question is in that, but someone jump in. Yeah, everything is uh, that much more difficult when things are distributed. Uh, I'm not sure where the commenting you were seeing in the DS106 was, Jeff. Um, was it centralized or distributed? Uh, Jim was just saying that a lot of the students, you know, would post a blog post, and all of a sudden there were 10 mm -hmm. comments, and that yeah. that really, you know, changed the dynamic. And part of that may be actually... Um, what helps with that is that the face-to-face -face traditional course component, they're being graded on their participation, and their yeah. participation grade is in part from the commenting on other blogs. So that, yeah. that helps push the environment forward. And then you've got to have cheerleaders and people who are saying, are you commenting? Are you commenting? Check out these, this blog post. Check out that blog post. And Jim Groom does a really good job of that, I think, of continually saying, have you seen this post? Go over there and comment it. Have you seen that post? You know, Continually putting that stuff out there and pressuring people to do it. And I just want yeah, to we, we did to, that Julia and, uh, to, to join in the hangout. Sorry. Julia's in the chat room, and I, I guess she left her meeting early or it wrapped up, so please uh, do join in, Julia. Sorry, Stephen. We did that in CCK08, and people complained. <laughs> people complained uh, because no it was what. like, yeah, it's uh, the, the story then was uh, in a connectivist course, instructors shouldn't be picking favorites to say, go comment on. Uh, so. And and uh, you know similarly you know uh, we had people signed up for the actual official course in connectivism 08 and also 09 and there were comments about whether you know participation with the uh, paid students and unpaid students was equal or unequal so it was it was all very interesting. Welcome, Julia. Hello. I, think I'm, I, I had the time wrong. I'm sorry. <laughs> the, the question is, how did the magic happen in DS106? I the really think that... WordPress played a huge part. I know I, I know you hate to talk about tools. I hate to talk but... about tools? What are you talking about? <laughs> well, I don't want to say it's only the tool, but I think WordPress was pretty critical because everybody was on the same platform so that the pingbacks, mm. when you're able to... So, for example, the best example yeah, is right. last week was Timmy Boy's um, Everyone's an Artist week and so people are able to go read his bit, take quotations, cite him and then it will automatically ping back so then Timmy will see that oh somebody's talking about something that I've said and go and read it and then this conversation starts. It's, it's so simple but it's a huge thing to make that connection that you're, you're making reference to somebody else. Like often in Change 11 I will be referencing lots of things that I've been reading but because they're on TypePad or Blogger, they'll never find out mm -hmm. unless I go there and say, oh, by the way, I commented on your blog. You know, I'm taking ideas that you had, great ideas that you had, and I'm reforming them into something new. And the, those conversations aren't happening the same way. That's what I meant when uh, I said, you know, when things are distributed, everything becomes ten times harder. That's one of those things. Yeah, I know you want to have choice and you want to allow it, and I'm not, <laughs> I don't like yeah. to say that you can only use this thing, but with DS106, that was part of it, right? You had to have your own domain, you had to have mm -hmm. a WordPress blog. That was, so I think that building that structure helped make it a tighter community. And, and it's amazing how quickly you can be criticized for not offering choice if you make some of these technology decisions. It's almost as though it would happen in the very instant you've made that decision. But well, we can't think of any cases where we've been criticized for making technology decisions, can we? There, are, there could be recommendations, though. I know a lot of, there are a lot of people who, when I was like, why aren't you on a WordPress blog? They're like, I don't know, I just chose mm -hmm. one. <laughs> and then some people didn't even have a blog because that wasn't even a recommendation that they have. Yeah. And they're like, do I need one? It's like, yes, go get a WordPress blog right now. <laughs> yeah. And so then they would. And so then, and then we're able to have this conversation where these things are happening. So I think that's really critical. And I love, I love that there's a repository site where people can read all the blog posts. But I find commenting on the blog posts at, at the um, the change. dot dot ca uh, fractures that conversation because it's it's now a third place, right? Mm -hmm. So there's my blog, there's your blog, and now there's this third place that fractures yeah. the conversation. Yeah, there are three separate places, and there isn't a good way of unifying them yet. Yeah, like, how, how do I know that Brainy Smurf commented on my post on, on, your, on your site? I don't find yeah. out. I don't get a notification of that. 
so then I have to go there to find it and then I yeah. start this conversation and I'm like now this is no longer on my blog so when you're mm -hmm. it, now I've lost control of the conversation about my topic it's mm -hmm. now with you and if something happens you take that site down now I no longer have that conversation it's not on my own site so I don't know I think I think that having it as your own as your own space is really important well, and I'll also and that's mention the best thing that, that the S106 did. Sorry. <laughs> no, that's okay. I was just going to say one other thing that Jim really pushed uh, people in DS106 to do was install the WordPress plugin and subscribe to comments so yeah. that on almost every blog that you went to, there was a checkbox saying subscribe to the comments feed and that would come via email. Mm -hmm. So you would get an email notification if someone commented and that really kept the conversation going where I know personally if I leave a comment on, on somewhere that, where I can't subscribe to that in any way, I'll never go back because I'll never know if that mm -hmm. conversation is continuing or not. It also keeps you in connection with that. Like you forget that you've commented on somebody's blog. You know something simple like, wow, that was hilarious, great, good work, you know, or you made me think about something. And then you leave and then somebody says something really insightful afterwards. You wouldn't really know to go back. So getting that kind of email or whatever notification is awesome. See, what, what we want is a mechanism whereby the comment, wherever it's made, goes back to the original blog post where it may be added as a comment to that original blog post presumably with the uh, blog post or approval and you want to yeah. be able and to do that on all blog platforms yeah that's what should happen dear Santa you know what you know would be I, and I don't know I think you're measuring this already but this is would be the most useful thing if you have all this R&D kind of expertise to do is is mapping out those connections that are that are happening and how are, how are those forming, mm -hmm. right? So I came across a blog, I read it, I commented, and then it pinged back because I commented. So it pings to my site, and then that person goes to my site and comments. And to to track those kind of, I mean, that really is where where the power is. I, like I don't know how that yeah. forms and who are these keystone people that are are causing that kind of. Um, you know, critical thinking change would be really interesting to track. If, I mean, it, I, yeah. it's imaginary in my mind. Although I think when I first met Dave Cormier, he told me, he, I think he told me you were doing that. So then uh, I've always sort of like, no, Stephen Downs is going to do it. It's going to happen. It's going to exist. And I'm working on it. I, I've, the Grasshopper is doing the analysis. It's creating a graph of links and people. Uh, it doesn't descend to the level of comments in blogs, though. I don't have access to that yet. I could do it. It's just the data management issues now get a bit challenging. So where uh, is it doing it in the on your site? It does it. Yeah, it's doing it in Grasshopper. There's no output from it yet. Right. Uh, there, there is there is a graph API, but I'm not sure the API is working at the moment. But it's collecting all this data. This data will be available. So. But just once I figure out how to make it available, it will be available. But again, these are scripts I need to write. I agree See, with I don't Julia. Really comment on Grasshopper. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, I, I agree with you, Julia, that the conversations uh, and the critical thinking are really important to be able to capture, not only from the person who initiated the conversation, but for the people who became involved. Uh, one of the things that I've <clears throat> been tossing around is what what is it that we want out of MOOCs? <clears throat> Excuse me. And what is our audience? Because one of the things I find is that the variety of technology is a learning experience in itself for a number of MOOC participants who would not have been exposed to the types of technology or had the inclination to even use them if they were mm. exposed to them. So modeling the various sorts of technology in the MOOCs I think is also a valuable learning experience and I don't know how anybody else feels about that. I agree. Well, one of the things I really <laughs> liked, <clears throat> one of the things I really liked about DS one hundred six was that it got people using odd and unusual things right from the get go. Uh, the first assignment, for example, to create an animation, which which had you using imaging software and animating software, you know, that that was. That was good. Uh, the whole radio thing and all the audio recording, and, and of course we know where DS106 radio went, uh, that, that was really wonderful. I'd love to see that kind of component on our course. Um, 
it's it's one thing though to say you'd love to see it, and it's another thing to implement it because uh, as soon as you say, okay, I'm going to like like Grant set up the uh, the Dropbox and drop it to me, right? As soon as you set something like that up and then send several thousand people to it, you've now committed yourself to a maintenance task. Jeff knows all about that. <laughs> um, and, and that is often the barrier. It is just the maintenance of it. And, and it's easy, easy to say, well, okay, well, just distribute your maintenance. Well, that's fine. And that's what we're trying to do. And we're saying to participants in the course, you know, we encourage you to do this. We encourage you to set up groups or, or file drops or whatever you want to do. Um, but now the, the other side of it is, you know, people are saying, well, yeah, but we want the official support for this. You know, we don't want it to be just students. So there's always this trade-off. But, you know, I'd love to see, you know, more interesting dynamic activities in these courses. So it's just a matter of how to facilitate that. And that was one, one of, of my the, points one with... One of the greatest things sorry. I've seen... Oh, I'm sorry. Well, as you one say, of the most I'm sorry. You go, Carol. Seen is, the fact that, is the fact that the participants also shape the learning. It's not just mm -hmm. the creation of the MOOC. It's not just the facilitation of the MOOC. The participants also shape the MOOC. And I'm sure DS106 uh, can speak to that with, with uh, great glee because I've seen some marvelous things come out of DS106 in the people who are in there shaping which direction the course is going, whether you want it to go that way or not. It does go that way. And the other thing that DS106 did for me is Jim Groom got me to start a website, which mm -hmm. is still sitting there. I'm not using it, just got involved in this MOOC, but it's sitting there for me to play around with. So all of these MOOCs um, have given me something, and I hope that the participants that are involved in them find as much joy in learning as I have in, in working within all of them. And I'm sorry, Jeff, I walked right on top of you, and I'm going to turn my mic off now and shut up. No problem. I, I uh, wallow in the messiness. Uh, <laughs> uh, one of the things I was discussing with Dave, and you mentioned kind of how the participants kind of want to hang out with the teachers still. You know, they don't want just to go over there and have their conversation. And that was kind of my hope for these Friday sessions. Like, the presentations are great, but as Dave often points out, it's a presentation. I could listen to a podcast and watch a slide share, and it's the same thing. The conversations for me are always so much more interesting. I loved the conversation that you guys had with Nancy White on Friday. I'd love to see the conversations with you, Dave, and or George, uh, and it doesn't have to be everybody every week, with the presenters kind of toward the end of the week after they've made the presentation, after people have kind of had some time to digest and reflect and process, and bring in some participants. And Scott mentioned earlier, you know, I'm always pro-interactive and come join us in the Hangout. You don't have to have 80 people, you know, bring in a few. So it's you guys and the presenter and a couple people who had interesting blog posts. And like, that's the discussion I want to listen to. And whether it happens in Illuminate, ugh, or Google Hangouts or other places, I would love to see that in some way. Yeah, and I love those discussions. You know They're the great audio. Week, the session this week was in, uh, uh, it's, all, it's now in Collaborate, which isn't Illuminate, actually. It looks more like Wimbo, right? That They've taken the more Wimbo interface. Anyway, it, um, Nancy did it really in, highly interactive. Mm -hmm. So, and she, and it was, there was so much text going on, and then there was all this writing on the screen, and it was so, it was a little bit overwhelming, and I said something like, too much, uh, too much information. And so she said, stop. Everybody stop. Put your hands over your head. <laughs> and so here we are in all our remote locations. And, and I did. I put my hands over my head. And, and, uh, and she said, okay, now let's take a minute to process. Let's all think about one thing. And so she really facilitated us and guided us into the right direction. So I saw that um, it's not really the, the tool in that case. There's a, there's a lot of strong facilitation mm -hmm. that needs to happen. And before, previously, I had thought, wouldn't it be great if our presenters actually had like a little pre-recorded Pecha, Kucha, Pakachka kind of style presentation that they already had done, that we all could watch with the presenter, and then we could all have a conversation Flip about it classroom. afterwards. Yeah. You know, like, the, here's the lesson, boom, have it, or whatever. You know, there's obviously going to be some amount of content. I understand. Not everything can be like this 
you know, <laughs> this big Socratic dialogue. But at some point, there's like, like here are the, the key things that I want to talk about. Let's hear the ideas. And it, they're done in like a really kind of, not flashy, but, you know, in an engaging, um, interesting way. And then we all have a conversation together with that facilitator. And it's facilitated, which I really think is important. Because when people are just typing and writing, and, and it, we're crazy. We're not even paying attention. Like, I couldn't stay straight. So Nancy did a, an excellent job. Were you there, Stephen? I can't remember if, no. if you were there. Which no, yeah. So she, <laughs> it, it was one of the most interesting examples of whatever illuminate Wimba, which I, I you know I think Wimba is nicer than illuminate because we have illuminate on campus. It's horrible. Still judging tools here. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> no, that's that's was one it of the. Blackboard was with that one. Was this yeah. yesterday? Yeah. Uh, was it yesterday? Yeah, she was using Blackboard. That's the one I referred to earlier before you came in. Yeah, on, on Monday she did it, right? Yeah, it was Monday. Yes. Yeah, uh, how many people were in that session, do you know? Because I haven't even looked at the recording yet. There were probably at least 25, I suppose, 30. 25? Yeah. Okay, well, that's good. Because we had less than 24 hours' notice. Uh, yeah, the no, time for that no, session. No. She's going to do it again on Friday. She'll be there on the Friday one. Oh, she will. She said she can come to it. Yeah, Friday. News anyway. to me. See, this has been this has been our problem with this course. This stuff is news to me. <laughs> well, we should we you should actually make the Wednesday session with Jeff part of it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and you know, I'm cool certainly cash should be. I'm certainly open part of the to, conversation. you know, and I know right. maybe they can't come at that time. Mm -hmm. I'm certainly open to facilitating that kind of conversation I was mm. discussing, and I don't know if I have much to add to it, but I will be glad to be a, a silent streamer. Um, no, uh, I just know what I mean. I mean, if you, if you want, if it's something that you want to talk about, that, I, I mean, people should be talking about it through the week and having hangouts, ge like, generally. I think that's what the point would, yeah. um, people had been saying, like, why... If we want to change education, why are we um, forcing George, Stephen, and Dave to, to do everything, right? <laughs> right. And on that so, note, you know, I would love to work with Tim. Tim is one of the the streaming geeks that I look up to. I mean, he he's done stuff that I don't know how to do, and um, I would love to work together and overcome these barriers because frankly what I'm doing right now is just not that hard and mm -hmm. I think it's a tool that's free and it's not open but it's free and it works pretty well and I think there's a lot of interesting conversations that could happen and be shared if people kind of just learned a little bit about the technology. There you go. I, I love working with Tim. Tim's the bestest. Although I will say that I'm not going to pretend that the Wowza stuff is easy or in any way, yeah. shape, or form. It's definitely not. There's something to be said for you know what live stream has done. It, you know the biggest issue is always just the yeah. the overwhelming amount of ads that they seem to want to insert every which way. And that's always going to be the case with these services until you install your own uh, your own streaming service. I wanted to ask a little bit about Canvas, Tim, because you guys went to that conference this week or last week. Uh, this is, and they just made their system open. Uh, do they have any kind of tool like for the the live presentations? They have a tiny chat integration. So, which I I don't know that that scales. I'd, I don't know, Stephen, did y'all ever even look at Tiny Chat? I was just playing with it this morning, so that's the only reason I can speak to it. But no, I don't know I've... that it scales. To such no, a large I haven't audience. looked at Tiny Chat. Um, it, I think they support up to I want to say eight video um, video presenters. Uh, they do the whiteboard. They have the chat, um, and and I don't know if there's a limit to how many actual people can be in it. But it's an integration directly into their LMS. But it's just Tiny Chat. So it's you know when people hit on the chat button in the LMS, they automatically get entered with their name. But uh, other users can then join. You can hit a button, and it'll give you the link that you can then send out to Twitter, and other people can participate in that same chat. And for those not familiar with Canvas, this is an an option for a learning management system. Your university just switched from Blackboard to this. How's it going? As far as I understand, it's going really well. I don't get a whole lot of support calls about it, so I've been sort of starting to explore more about it on my own. Um, and I've been very impressed by their um, 
the nature of the product, it seems like they're they're not looking to reinvent the wheel. They're looking to integrate a lot of um, things that people already use. So there's the Google Docs integration. There's Tiny Chat integration. There's uh, Etherpad integration, and and they they're they've pretty much built a modular product where other tools can take advantage of it. So you you can still go there for your grading. You can go there for your assignments, but then you can incorporate these other tools directly into it. And they're making it really easy to do that. So I've been impressed what I've seen so far. Which product is this now specifically again? This is in Structures Canvas. So it's in Structure.com that has Canvas. And they actually have an open source component uh, only because they said they didn't want to be bought out by Blackboard. So that was their <laughs> way to tell. <laughs> they said if we make it open source, they can't buy us. So they did. Uh, so we use it as a hosted solution through them. Uh, but they do offer an open source product as well. Stephen, in Canada, the only person or uh, institution that I know of uh, so far is OCAD University is, is, is using it. How are they about allowing students to kind of publicly share their content? I mean, that was one of my frustrations with Blackboard, is you have this little environment in Blackboard where students create whatever content, and it lives and dies there, and they lose access to it, and it's gone forever. Does uh, uh, Canvas allow people to put it out there in the larger net? Absolutely. So the the course itself can be open. So you know it can have a publicly accessible URL, and you don't have to be a registered user to see any of that content. The students themselves can create their content elsewhere and submit that content as an assignment. So if you had an assignment to create a blog post, then they can submit the URL as their assignment and be graded against that. Um, I've also seen, I just started this morning playing around with the idea that the announcements that students get can be from an RSS feed. And it, like can be, and it can be defined not just to an RSS feed, but an RSS feed with particular text in the title. So, you know, your, your, as, your announcements mm -hmm. view could be multiple blogs, uh, you know, feeding right into it. So Blackboard that was really happy to, to see that. They must be getting their patent lawyers ready. Right. Yeah. Well, we're, we've hit the hour mark, uh, so we should probably head into the home stretch here. Any uh, closing thoughts, questions, seeds to plant? Julia, you had something you wanted to ask about Grasshopper. Oh, no, I wanted it to do that. Um, I wanted you to be able to track everything so that we could oh, okay. bring, bring blogging to the next level and use it in assessment so that the so learner <laughs> analytics were there. But as, right. a, as a closing, as a clo on my closing, I think that, that that I think that any kind of criticism um, that it's not a criticism that I think it's going very well and I think people just want to make it better and we can actually really mm -hmm. work well together to make it better and I really think the key is in having these little conversations so Jeff I'm really I really appreciate you having a little midweek conversation I'm going to start hanging out with you more in Google awesome <laughs> so thanks for having me yeah I, I like them too I hang out as much as I can I know it doesn't look like much but is every chance I get, I'm here. Yeah, they're great sessions, Jeff. I thank you uh, for me, and, and great sessions to get to know other people and to learn. And that's what it's all about, is learning and exchanging ideas. And thank you for inviting me, Jim. Jeff. Jim, thanks for being here. Bye, and, Jim. <laughs> and, and thank you all very much. I, I can't tell you what a pleasure it is to uh, talk with a whole bunch of interesting smart people and thank you for all the different creative endeavors you do tim i'm looking forward to our second date where we're going to talk about wowza streaming and all sorts of other stuff uh and in the meantime we'll stay tuned to dtlt and change 11 and all sorts of these cool things going on uh we'll be when will that week. second date be jeff uh don't know uh oh, okay. all right well, hey let's set a date tim what's good for you <laughs> I'm, if you, <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, uh, I'm, I'm free today, um, and then otherwise I'd have to look at my calendar, which is not in front of yeah. me right now, but um, I'll I get am back to you. once again underprepared for my 9 a.m. class, and it's past midnight here, so I'm thinking I'd better pass on that. Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, but uh, next week, it's going to happen sometime next week. Okay. Stay tuned to our social media sphere for uh, details. Thanks, everybody. Have a great week. Thanks, Jeff. Bye, everybody. Thank Bye, you. Bye.